Hello, class. I am going to do the second uh, lecture. I was going to try to do this lecture yesterday. Uh, I think we had a good lecture uh, yesterday uh, concerning coaxial cables and the size, the frequency, and you can start to see the general uh, uh, properties of the phenomena of signal transmission over a coaxial cable. You know, I, I wrote some stuff down here that I wanted to talk about. And one of the things that I mentioned in the last lecture that I, I, I wanted to, um, and this isn't really so much electromagnetic field theory as it is uh, an understanding of the applications of uh, electromagnetic field theory. And you could see that in the last several um, examples that I've done with the coaxial cable and, and metallic conductors being used to, as waveguides, really, for the signal to propagate over. But, but let's talk a little bit about uh, a hierarchy, because I, I find when I teach this course that a lot of students have intuitive uh, understanding of these things that are entirely wrong, entirely wrong. And that's what I want to, you know, I, I want to set you up so you know what's really going on. You have an idea of what's really going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, that broadcasting antenna is uh, pumping out 50,000 watts and, and, and it's pumping out uh, a carrier wave for that radio station and the audio wave is rolling over the top of it. But, but here's my question to you. How does it do it? How does that omnidirectional antenna at the radio station make music in my car, right? Now, now is it sending out electrons? Is it shooting out electrons and electrons just, they'll hit my antenna on my car? The answer is no. No, 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 no. That is not what is happening. And I'm gonna get more into, into that. But the one thing, but, but just mentioning that, <clears throat> I think a lot of people think that all wires would be able to carry the same bandwidth of frequencies. Right, like uh, for instance, you know the telephone through where whatever data communications course you have, you probably know this telephone only has about a 3,000 hertz bandwidth from about 300 hertz, even less than that really, around 100 hertz up to about 3,100 to 3,300 hertz. So it's about a 3,000 hertz spectral bandwidth, right? <clears throat> so, how much bandwidth can various different geometries of two wires carry? That's probably what you're asking yourself. What, what could they carry? Well, if I just have two wires, and, and I'm just gonna draw this as two wires, right? So two wires. Two wires can handle about 25, let's not even say that, let's say more like 15 megahertz. I'll say 10 megahertz, right? Well, I was gonna turn this on too. Uh, well, I know it's like 12, 18, why don't I set the timer? Uh, we'll turn that back down to about 31 minutes. I think I've been going for about four minutes and uh, we'll see how it goes. So, so two wires, if I was transmitting a signal, let's say I'm trying to transmit a video signal, which would be a four megahertz bandwidth signal over two wires. Well, I couldn't do it, could I? Oh wait, yes I could, well, 10 megahertz. I mean, I've got about altogether about six megahertz in TV station. So I could, I could probably transmit a TV station uh, over two wires. Now, that's two wires. Now, if I take those two wires 
and I twist those two wires. Right, I'll use red to show the other wire. So if I twist those two wires and twist them about every three inches, right? That's called a twisted pair. Now, a twisted pair, uh, an unshielded twisted pair can probably get about 20 megahertz, so about twice the bandwidth that you could get with uh, just uh, uh, two wires, two parallel wires. And, and the reason for that is that as I twist these, they decouple the capacitance per unit length. Isn't that amazing? We're not doing anything. We still got two wires. Yes, is it going to take a little bit longer? No, nah, not much. So if I just twist those wires uh, about every two or three inches, that should decouple the capacitance on those wires, and that should allow me to transmit almost twice the bandwidth just for twisted pairs. Now, let's say that I went a step further, and I took those twisted pairs. I'm going to just draw them down here. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm just twisting them, but I'm doing something else too to them. They're twisted, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a shield around them, right? So that they are enclosed in a grounded shield. And that's called a shielded twisted pair. Just a second. Hello again, class, and I am sorry about that interruption, but when the phone rings, I have to answer it because I am closing on the four family uh, next door tomorrow. And at the, you know, the 11th hour and 59th minute, really, uh, that's when everything starts to go wrong and you have to be present. Um, you know, if your lawyer calls or the bank calls or whatever, you always have to be around. And, um, and yesterday, uh, that happened quite a bit. But because I've done this so many times, this, is my, this will be my 58th property that I've bought in my lifetime. And, um, and I, I, of course, don't have 58 of those. I have like 10. But uh, uh, what I found through my experience is that things go wrong. You, you, you have to, you can't be shoveling gravel for a driveway. You can't be going out riding the motorcycle. You basically have to sit here because people for two days prior to a closing on any property, um, things go wrong. You'd like to think that everything goes smoothly and that the banks and the lawyers and the government, uh, and the utilities all have this worked out, but they don't. So uh, as a matter of fact, I just realized uh, another thing that I had to do. So uh, I'm gonna stop this recording again. Well, I've decided not to go and do anything. I'm gonna finish this lecture and then I will go and do whatever I, it is that I have to do. All right, now. Let's, uh, let's continue on. So I've got a shielded twisted pair and just that shielding, just putting, and of course you, you, you've got to remember this is like a aluminum braid that goes around the outside of this and then I ground it. And what that does, that shielded twisted pair is it stops any outside electronic interference from getting to the twisted pair inside. So you can get about 30, uh, megahertz uh, through a shielded twisted pair. And so you, this is basically the hierarchy of what you can use. You can't get, you, well, you're probably thinking, well, uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're, we're going to look at a what's called twin lead. And twin lead, I'm going to draw it in a cross section so that uh, you, and I'll try to draw it in three dimensions. 
So twin lead looks something like this, and it has a wire in here. You've probably seen this if you have uh, a, a, an FM tuner, and uh, you've seen, you know, twin lead. This, by the way, is a plastic separator. Right, so that's plastic in between there. But predominantly, if we look at the electric field for a, a twin lead, we can see that the electric field, right, goes like this. Like we've seen for, for many, um, right? So that's how the electric field goes. And if we say that this is the plus uh, and this is the minus, then they would be going in that direction. Should I put that there? I'm just gonna draw the field lines without any direction right now, because I think everybody knows how the field lines <clears throat> go around that two wire system. Uh, that, by the way, is called twin lead. Twin lead is different than ribbon cable. Ribbon cable could have a lot more than just two leads in it, and it's not separated by uh, you know, a certain distance. And in fact, when I talk about tw twin lead, and I'm gonna talk about it maybe in this uh, lecture, uh, I want to just specify a, a couple things here. So if we look at the twin lead like this, then this distance right here, is going to be 2a. <clears throat> Basically what we're saying is the diameter of this is going to be 2a, so a is the radius of either one of the two wires, right? And then the distance between those two wires is going to be 2d, right? So just so that I can give you some type of geometry and what we're gonna be looking for later on, of course, is what D is and what A is. I'm gonna come up with A uh, when, when we look at this. You know, let me drop a line down here so that we can you know, keep, keep this uh, separated. <clears throat> I hope everybody likes the fact that I finally have figured this all out and now it's not, it's not changing or anything <laughs> for the future. All right. so. We're up to this, and then uh, what can twin lead handle? Twin lead can handle about 300 megahertz, right? So about 300 megahertz for that, 30 megahertz for uh, shielded twisted pair, about 20 megahertz for twisted pair, and about 10 megahertz for just two wires next to each other. And as you can see, changing the geometry and working with the propagation delay and working with the telegrapher's equations is showing us newer geometries that we can use that uh, will give us much higher. I mean, this is really by keeping that distance there. It's about a one centimeter spacer between the two different lines that we have here. We now can transmit 10 times as much. We're still only using two wires, right? This is still just a wire, this is still just a wire, but now our geometry is in such a way that we're forming a conduit for the propagation of the signal. And, and don't ever forget, the signal is propagating here. You might say, well, the signal's propagating in air, right? Propagating in air, propagating in air, propagating in air, propagating in air. So the majority of the signal is propagating through air here. And so we know that for all four of these configurations, that the relative permittivity is one and the relative permeability is one. It's not until we get to coaxial cables that we start looking at a dielectric other than air, right? Because when we start to look at coaxial cables, and uh, I think everybody has seen me draw uh, the cross section of a coaxial cable enough times uh, to know that this is B and this is A, right? The radius of the center conductor is A, the outside one is B. 
when we look at this, we know <coughs> we know the <coughs> consideration. So this one can really go, and I'll call this coax, coaxial cable. Let's call it that. That's what it is. And this can go to about 600 megahertz, right? After we get to a, co a coaxial cable geometry, we really can't go to, I mean, we, we could talk about, you know, microwave horns on things and stuff like that. But <clears throat> right now we're talking about metallic conductor based signal channels. And, and this is uh, what we've got here. And so 600 megahertz, that's right. Uh, and that's where the coaxial cable comes in. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at what if, you know, we, we looked at a coaxial cable for, for one kilometer. What was the attenuation for one kilometer at 500 megahertz? What was the attenuation for one kilometer at 500 hertz? And then what was the attenuation for a larger coaxial cable that still maintained the same ratio between inner radii, uh, the signal radii wire, and the outer um, shell radius, right? Out here, I shouldn't say shell, but the outer uh, cylinder. Anyway, so we, we looked at all of that. Now what I wanna do is I wanna uh, say, okay, well, what if I took, right? We know that this, this comes in several different flavors, 56 ohm, 58 ohm, 75 ohm. Um, I'll just write down 75 ohm because you know that's uh, what we use when we are working through our uh, examples. Up here though, for twin lead, twin lead uh, usually runs at around 300 ohms. And that's much closer to the characteristic impedance of air, isn't it? You know, let's look at the characteristic uh, impedance of air and to do that we've got to now start to look at twin lead look at twin lead uh this preceded coaxial cable but let's look at twin lead and see how its uh propagation coefficient would compare to coaxial cables uh propagation coefficient i, I want to, to point out uh before we go through this example that uh, what we're going to find is that it's not much different. But what is different? What is difference between a coaxial cable and uh, twin lead? I mentioned before that twin lead propagates all through air, right? So when we look at where it's propagating through, it's propagating through air. So that leaves it wide open for the same problem that twisted pairs had. Once I put the shield around the twisted pairs, I got a much better um, bandwidth for that uh, communication channel, didn't I? I could do that here. I could put a giant thing. And in fact, most twisted uh, lead today comes with a ground shield around it. If you go to Radio Shack and get twisted uh, lead, a twin lead, you'll, you'll find a outer ground shield uh, around that now. But we don't need that with coaxial cable, do we? Because it carries its own ground shield. It carries its own Faraday cage that's grounded on the outside, uh, and it uses that outside. So even though we put one around here, we wouldn't use it. Whereas here, we have to use it as part of the geometry of the communication channel. Okay, now, uh, let's go to twin lead and look at the equations for twin lead. So when I'm looking at the equation for characteristic impedance for twin lead, again, it's eta divided by two pi. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going back to the old uh, coax. So it's eta divided by pi. I'm just going to get rid of that too. It's eta divided by pi times the inverse hyperbolic cosine of D over A. So what would be the inverse function of the inverse hyperbolic cosine? 
it would be the hyperbolic cosine, wouldn't it? That's right, because this is the inverse hyperbolic cosine. Okay, just so that everybody knows that. So, so uh, really, let's, uh, we could do this to find out what our ratio of D over A is. First of all, for this twin lead, I'm going to say that A is going to be, we're going to do it in two forms. We're going to do A equals one millimeter. Now, what that would mean is that uh, what you've got, in fact, I'll draw the two different configurations uh, up here. Uh, I'm going to do one with A equals one millimeter. That's the first one. And then I want to do it with A equals 0.5 millimeters. Does everyone see? So I'm going to do it with two different widths. And I want to compare R prime, C prime, L prime if I have two different uh, things. Now, the ratio is going to be the same because didn't I say that for twin lead, we have 300 ohm is our characteristic impedance. Now, let's figure out what eta is for uh, air. We know what it is for the dielectric inside the coaxial cable because we did that in the last uh, set of example problems, right? So we know what that is. That's 2.36 is its dielectric uh, relative permittivity. But in here, we have no relative permittivity, do we? So, so if we look at this, where can I write? I'll write it down here. So let's do it for air, right? I wanted to put that sub air underneath there. So what I can do then is this is just the square root of mu sub r times mu sub o divided by epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o, right? So we know that it's one for air. So we can really say that's gone and that's gone so that this basically equals uh, four pi times 10 to the minus seven Henry's per meter divided by um, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, right? That's all taken to the square root. And so when we take that to the square root, you actually get 376.7, but I'm going to round it uh, down to three or, or up to 377. So 377, and when we work all of these things out, because if you look at it here, this is going to be in ohms. This has no units. This has no units. So we know that this also has to be in ohms. So the characteristic of outer space, the characteristic impedance of outer space, the characteristic impedance of the atmosphere really uh, is approximately 377 ohms. And that 377 ohms is very close to the 300 ohms, isn't it? In fact, why don't we write this out? So 300 ohms equals 377 ohms divided by pi times the inverse hyperbolic cosine of D over A. All right. So let's find D over A. So D over A, that ratio is going to be 300 ohms times pi divided by 377 ohms Boy, did I screw that one up, didn't I? I should just write uh, D over A. I'm going to do that, and then uh, I'm going to fix the other side here. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, boy, my uh, thing is really working out well here. There you go. So what I'm going to do uh, so that it all works out fine is I'm going to put Hyperbolic cosine, right there. No, it hadn't dried, and that's why I've got white all over my thing, but that's the hyperbolic cosine, isn't it? You're probably saying, oh my God, he just, uh, that was the inverse hyperbolic cosine, so the opposite to the inverse hyperbolic cosine is the hyperbolic cosine. So I'm just gonna take the hyperbolic cosine of this, and that's going to give me D over A, right? 
So we can uh, figure out what uh, D over A is, and I had it. So uh, D over A is 6.13. I think I have that, right? So we wanna look at these two different geometries here too. So, so why don't I put those two geometries right down here? I, I think, I hope everybody can see this. So, if I have the one millimeter, I'm going to have a, a situation set up like this. Now, now don't uh, check the scale or whatever, but I've got a situation set up like this, where this itself, and this is for the one A equals one millimeter. I'm gonna put that disclaimer in there. So this then would be two millimeters. Does everyone see that? And this distance would be from, from here to here, which we know is two times D. Now two times 6.13 is 12.26. So this would be 12.26 millimeters. I hope everybody can see that, I'll check, but I'm pretty sure that uh, everybody can see that, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So how about our second one, though, where we're looking at the 0.5? A equals 0.5 millimeters. Then what I would have is I have the same, I'm going to draw the same configuration that I had. Uh, but instead now, this distance right here is just going to be one millimeter. Right? Does everybody see that? And this distance between the two is going to be uh, 6.13 millimeters. Now, I, I'm only doing this to show you the difference in geometry. This would be a much narrower one, but with a much smaller wire. This would be a much wider one, but with a, a, a wire that's twice as uh, large as the other wire. In fact, this one, let's put a, a star here. This one is the way that they have designed uh, Twinly. So that A is about one millimeter. And so what I wanna do is I want to, to look through that. So we've got D over A now. We can start to figure out what some of our other things are. I just, uh, for your you know, studying and everything, I'm just going to circle a couple of these equations, right? That equation is an uh, important equation for twin lead because I'll just put a red dot there because that is uh, your characteristic impedance, right? So let's go through, let's figure out what our other things are. How about uh, C prime, right? Now the equation for um, C prime is going to be pi times epsilon. Remember that epsilon is epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o, right? Let's write that up there. Epsilon equals epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o. Mu equals mu sub r times mu sub o, right? <clears throat> Let's always remember those things. Okay, uh, so pi times epsilon divided by the inverse hyperbolic cosine of D over A. You know, why don't we do that? Why don't I just write that uh, down here because we're gonna use it a few times. So the inverse hyperbolic cosine of 6.13, right? Uh, I, I, I'm just doing this right here. This inverse hyperbolic cosine times D over A, right? So it's just so that we could use that. Uh, 
you know, uh, in calculating things later on, it might make it a little uh, easier uh, to do that. So uh, I'll just give you that uh, inverse hyperbolic cosine of 6.13. Wow. Two point five. Two point five zero, and that is uh, a significant figure. That that zero there. So let's figure this out. So if I've got pi, right times, uh, in this case eight point eight five times ten to the minus twelve farads per meter, right? Uh, do I have anything else there? Yes, I have the relative permittivity, which we know of as one. We don't even have to put it there because we know it's one. And then that's going to be divided by 2.50. Now, I hope that this comes out to what I thought it was, which is 11.12 picofarads per meter. 11.12 picofarads per meter. Now, uh, I'm just going to check that for a second. Uh, pi times 8.85 exponent minus 12 divided by 2.5 equals, there you go, 11.12 picofarads per meter. So yes, so let's do a couple things here. Here is your equation, right, for the twin lead. And here is uh, that. Now you're probably saying, wow, that's a lot less than the coax. Uh, my, also, I want to, to put up here that this is at 500 megahertz, right? So we are comparing uh, things working at the same frequency. So if you remember with the coax, we had, 68 point uh, something picofarads per meter. So you can see that the uh, capacitance per unit length with the twin lead is much less. In fact, about five times less, six times less than uh, it would be for the coax. All right, let's go to L prime. Now L prime is mu divided by pi times the inverse hyperbolic cosine of D over A. I better put parentheses around those D, yeah, I have, okay, so good. So, so mu, we know that the relative permeability is the same uh, for air as it is in the uh, um, depths of space. So we're just gonna use four pi, so 12.56, uh, to the minus seventh, or uh, 10 times, oh wait, well, yeah, minus seventh, divide, oh wait, I just turned it off accidentally, sorry. <laughs> well, now I have to put it all back in again, which took me almost no time. Uh, and I get uh, one times 10 to the minus six. And I'm going to call this 1.000 with three lines above those O's times 10 to the minus six Henry's per meter because it actually comes out to 9.9949. So those are basically uh, uh, all, uh, all the same. So let's also sur surround that equation for twin lead. So we've got two equations there, very similar to each other, C prime, L prime, just like they always are. And then if we look at this, if we, if we look at one micro, we can see that that's much larger, isn't it? Because we got 384 nano Henry. So this is three times larger. So this is six times smaller, right? So six times smaller. And this is three times larger, okay? 
So you can see, see how that works. Now, for, since it's 500 megahertz, we know that R sub S, right? Because R sub S, and I'm gonna write the equation for R sub S up here, the square root, right? And I know how to remember it now. I put them all in the same line. Rho, pi, mu, F. Right? That's R sub S because they're all in a row for R sub S. And so if I, if I plug that in, I, I get the same thing. You can see there's nothing different, right? We're still using copper wire. We still uh, have, have relative permeability as one, and we still have a frequency of 500 megahertz, so there's no reason that this should change from what we got before, which was 5.62 times 10 to the minus three ohms, right? I'll put that right there. So if it's 5.62 times 10 to the minus three ohms, let's figure out what R prime is. We have a slightly different equation as you would expect for R prime. R prime in a twin lead is R sub S over pi A, right? So R sub S, uh, 5.62 times 10 to the minus 3 ohms divided by pi times A. Now, A in this one is going to be 0 0.001 meters, right? We've got to bring everything back to its primary units. Always do that. Then you can never fail, right? You can never fail if you bring it back to those uh, primary units. And so what I get is I get 1.79 ohms per meter. All right, so let's, let's circle that. And let's not forget our equation as to how we got that. So we do have quite a few things that we want to look at here and that we want to remember. I'm not really sure where I am. My timer says to stop. Um, but what I would really like to do is just to, to, to finish this. So let's do uh, alpha or, or gamma, the propagation uh, thing here, and figure out what this is going to be. And I happen to have this done. Uh, the way that I'll, I'll write it out is, uh, is full, but I, 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 I'll make some 1.79 ohms per meter, right? So it's R plus J omega L. So uh, 1.79, that's R plus J omega, 3.14 times 10 to the nine radians per second. I wanna put these in here, even though I, I may not uh, get the, the whole thing. Um, I'll put a bracket here. I shouldn't have put those around there. Anyway, times that. Uh, and then I have to uh, multiply that by zero. That's G, G plus J omega C. So zero plus J and then omega 3.14 times 10 to the nine radians per second. I'm writing small here. Omega C. And of course, C, 11.12 picofarads per meter. And I should put a bracket around there, but I think everybody knows that has to be taken to the square root. So I'm gonna jump. I've, I've put that in the, fr in, in the oven. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I've been watching uh, uh, the Great British Baking Show too often. So let's get to gamma. I multiplied this by that, that's zero. I'll do that one. Multiply this by that, that's zero. Multiply this by that. Multiply this by that. But here's what I end up getting. I'm going to show you in a couple steps so that you know um, uh, what it is that, uh, you know, how, how I'm getting this and everything else. All right. So, uh, yeah, I could, I could do it in two steps. Why don't I do that? I, I think I have enough room there. So 1.79 ohms per meter plus. Uh, 
3.14 times 10 to the 3 ohms per meter. Oh, there's a J there. Okay. And then multiplied by zero plus J, 34.8 times 10 to the minus three moles per meter. And that whole thing taken to the square root. There's a square root there. Don't forget that's a square root. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna step to the next one and give you uh, what it is that, that I end up getting here. So what we get is we get 109 at an angle. Those are one over meters squared, by the way. I mean, I, I can put the units there, one over meters squared, because the moles cancel out with the ohms, don't they? So it leaves me with one over meters squared. That's fine. Uh, at an angle of 179.96 degrees. And of course, that's taken to the square root. And that ends up giving us 10.44 at an angle of 89.98 degrees. <clears throat> right. And so you're thinking, OK, well, we're right down there now. We've got it. That's right. So what it is is 3.6 times 10 to the minus three nepers per meter plus J 10.44 radians per second. So there you go. Now 3.6 times 10 to the minus three nepers per meter comes out to, uh, not really any place to write it here, but uh, that comes out to 31.25 decibels per kilometer. I'll write that down and we'll do a comparison in the next uh, uh, lecture that we get, but I think I've got to stop this one now. I've been going on quite a while. <laughs>